Visit Elmhurst.org to explore the new City of Elmhurst website. Find out the latest Elmhurst news, pay utility bills and parking tickets, report concerns, and much more. Elmhurst.org is an ideal way to discover what Elmhurst offers your business, your family, your life. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Elmhurst College. My name is Alan Ray. I have the honor of being president of the college and also of welcoming you to the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Intercultural Lecture. This lecture, uh, established in 1993, is held each spring to coincide with Black History Month and is part of the college's annual celebration of black heritage. To begin our presentation, I want to bring to the podium Stanley Washington, one of our students who is the president of the Black Student Union. Stanley. Good evening. My name is Stanley Washington, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Black Student Union, which I am the president, as Dr. Ray mentioned. The Black Student Union at Elmhurst College is a group that strives to provide support uh, educate and provide awareness for uh, different cultural things going on on campus. We want to welcome you, uh, especially today as we have our fabulous speaker here. And you're going to hear some great information because I actually had the privilege of having lunch with this gentleman. Um, we also are glad you're here during Black History Month. And on this day, the 105th anniversary of the National uh, Association for the Advancement of Colored People of which we have a chapter that was started here at Elmhurst in the last year. It was actually nationally recognized. So <laughs> We welcome you and I'll be bringing up Dr. Ayanna Brown, who is in our education department. Good afternoon. I grew up in a black church. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, amen. <laughs> One way to think about and to study the civil rights movement is to engage in the soundtrack of that movement. And with a wonderful college that appreciates the range and diversity of music, um, there are hosts of texts, musical texts that we could look at to understand the movement itself and its inception of that movement. There is a particular group that I often use as a source of inspiration as well as a source of necessity um, for my own needs. And you may be familiar with that group being Sweet Honey and the Rock. The leader of Sweet Honey and the Rock and one of the writers of many of their music is Bernice Johnson Reagan. And these words were words that often um, resonated with me as a source to think about not just my personal pilgrimages, but what I was trying to do as a teacher in middle school, as a teacher in high school, and as an academic at the collegiate level. And so these are those words. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons, is as important as the killing of white men, white mothers' sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest. Welcome Elmhurst College to the annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Lecture. To Dr. Ray, Dr. Tipton, administrators, faculty colleagues, staff members, students, and board of trustees, not to mention the broader community members who've joined us today, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. What does this restlessness look like? What does freedom look like? 
How do freedom and restlessness coalesce to address deliberative movements toward equity? These are questions I wrestle with within my own scholarship, teaching, and learning. And while they're unresolved, I am made more thoughtful because of the work of others. Today, we are honored to have one of those others here, Dr. Sean Harper, scholar, teacher, to engage us and I suspect challenge us to think about the social, political, cultural, pedagogical, and everyday understandings of what does it mean to say next, when, how. Dr. Harper is an expert actively sought after to discuss issues of race in higher education and the range from access and equity to gender and engagement. With more than 80 peer-reviewed journal articles, numerous book contributions, Dr. Harper has established a body of scholarship that is impressive, but more importantly, impactful. One of my frequently referenced sociological reads of the 21st century is the work of Eduardo Bonilla Silva, entitled Racism Without Racists. He outlines that our liberalisms allow us to admit that we all believe racism is alive and pervasive in the United States. And yet, few of us want to invest in understanding how we might indeed be the racist. I mention this because Dr. Harper nuanced this understanding with an important text entitled Race Without Racism how higher education researchers minimize institutional norms. This work, I believe, we are here to think about because we are an institution of higher education. Have we, in practice, minimized race in our own institutional norms? I believe the depth and complexity of Dr. Sean Harper's work is a magnificent ember to ignite our discussions and actions at Elmhurst College. To hear him speak, to read his work, is to grow yet again. And so, it is my privilege to bring to you Dr. Sean Harper. I, for sure, believe in freedom and justice, and the myriad other things for which the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King stood and fought and died for. It is therefore my honor and pleasure to have been invited to give this address. It's something that I take very seriously. Um, I give about 30 speeches on college and university campuses annually. But there is something about being invited to give a speech that is named for Dr. King that makes me take it even more seriously, right? So I, I very much, again, appreciate having been invited uh, here today. There is, in fact, a part of that soundtrack from the Civil Rights Movement, um, which uh, Professor Brown just mentioned, that's titled, We Shall Overcome. It was made famous by Mahalia Jackson, who gives a stirring rendition of the song. In fact, uh, this morning, as I was putting the final touches on this speech, I listened to Mahalia Jackson sing, We Shall Overcome, in my iTunes, right, to sort of stir my spirit. But Martin Luther King also gave a speech titled, We Shall Overcome. Now, there is something in the uh, King speech and in the Jackson sung, sung rendition that leaves me wondering, right? They both say, we shall overcome someday. Now, those words were spoken and they were saying by those two over 40 years ago, over 50 years ago, right? It was, in fact, a song that was a part of the civil rights movement. We shall overcome someday. 
But I guess I'm left here wondering when, when might we overcome the persistent issues of race and injustice in our society? So it is that question that I hope to engage during our time here this evening. I invite you to engage with me uh, that question. Um, you can do it uh, via social media. Um, so certainly, if I see you on your devices, I will not mistake what you're doing for boredom or disengagement. But um, I always enjoy actually going back at the end of these talks and reading the, uh, the Twit chat to see what people were thinking at various moments of the talk. So I encourage you to, uh, to tweet if you're, if you're Twitter active. Um, I created a, a hashtag for this, Elmhurst MLK. Uh, so you know, do, do feel free to be engaged in that way. So what I will do here, and there'll be also time for Q&A at, at the end of this. But what I want to do here is talk a bit about Martin Luther King, given that this particular distinguished lecture is named for him. What I want to do, though, is take this opportunity uh, to correct perhaps one misreading of Martin Luther King. Sure, we know him most famously for his fight for racial justice. But there was more to Martin Luther King than fighting for black folk to be treated with an appropriate degree of humanity. That was certainly an important part of his fight, part of his mission, part of his life's work. Martin Luther King, though, was also deeply concerned with and committed to economic justice. Part of his civil rights approach very much was about economic justice and opportunity, not just for black folk, but for all folks, right? Uh, part of that is captured in this quote from Reverend King that says, we, re we refuse to believe there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. Right? So we're stuck even still with economic gaps and inequities in our country. Right? What you see here is an illustration of that, uh, where it says the ship is sinking. The ship is sinking. But yet the rich believe that, yeah, the ship may be sinking for those at the bottom. Martin Luther King were concerned with those at the bottom. Now, as was the case in the 1950s and 60s, it remains the case in the 2014s that blacks and Latinos and lower income whites are at the bottom of our economic system in this country, right? So I think it is important, right, to understand and to acknowledge that economic justice was a part of the King legacy. Now, another part of the King legacy that many of us are familiar with was the dream he articulated famously in a speech, right? Uh, I will not recite for you the whole speech, but there is a portion of it that I think is both important particularly given your context and where you are located. So Dr. King said in his famous I Have a Dream speech that I have a dream that one day little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. Now some version of that dream has in fact come to fruition. Certainly there are more examples of interracial and cross-racial cooperation than there were during the Civil Rights Movement. Part of that is even represented in the diversity of the audience that we have here this afternoon. But there's a piece of this particular dream that remains unrealized. What you see here is a map from 1954, before the Brown versus Board of Education school desegregation case was decided. The states that you see in black are the ones where racial segregation were still legal. The ones that you see in white, including the great state of Illinois, had outlawed racial segregation. Those that are in gray 
were the proverbial gray areas where there were no legislative mandates one way or the other. This was the picture before the Brown decision. Now, as you may recall, in 1954, the US Supreme Court deemed unlawful these vestiges and patterns of racial segregation. They deemed separate but equal unlawful, especially in schools, right? School segregation was no longer to be the norm in the United States of America. Now, it took quite a bit of time, right? The, 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 the courts and the states did not move with all deliberate speed on desegregating schools. But it was in 1954, 60 years ago, that school desegregation was deemed unlawful. But yet, sociologist William Massey, education professor Gary Orfield, and myriad others remind us that schools today are just about as segregated as they were before Brown. So the King vision about little black boys and little white girls and I think he probably would have even added some Latinos and Asian Americans and Native Americans into the mix, right? Yeah, that part of the dream remains unrealized in our hyper-segregated America. So you see here an illustration of the ghost from segregation past, right? What you also see here is that Chicago, by some sociological accounts, is the most segregated place in the country, right? Not far from where your campus is are some durable patterns of racial segregation. I would surmise, I've only been here on your campus for a little over four hours, but I would imagine that that might even have some spillover effect to this campus, the norms of the campus, how students interact on the campus. I'm not entirely certain, but could be, right? And I see some affirmative head nods in, in the audience. Um, what you see on the, on the other side, on your, on your right, is uh, I'm going to lay off Chicago for one moment and talk about New York City, where I recently uh, did some research in 40 public New York City high schools. Those 40 public high schools were 94% black and Latino, which again represents the resegregation of American schools. Right? So although our country has become more racially diverse, for sure, particularly with the growth of Latinos, the schools where students attend before they come to the college or to the university remain just as segregated as they were when King imagined and dreamed of something different. Here's another illustration about what happens oftentimes in these racially segregated schools. And it's funny math, right? Math that doesn't quite add up. One white kid in well-funded white schools plus one black kid in an underfunded, what this person calls ghetto school, equals one well-educated American child equipped for the future. Right, so as we think about King's dream, that part of it, I would argue, remains unrealized. Now, I was just talking mostly about what happens in public schools before college. But do let me spend just a moment talking about mine and Sylvia Hurtado's work on campus racial climates. Sylvia Hurtado is a professor at UCLA and director of the UCLA Higher Education Research Institute she and I did a multi-campus study of campus racial climates. From that study emerged nine themes. In the interest of time, I won't talk with you about all nine of the themes, but I will talk with you about the one concerning pockets and durable patterns of racial segregation. Even on the campuses that were racially diverse, 
Students often confessed that they didn't really interact substantively across racial difference. Put a different way, simply throwing a bunch of students from different racial backgrounds into a residence hall and expecting them to magically interact across difference and learn from the diversity that was brought to the institution did not work. Does that make sense? Students would even say to us in the interviews on these campuses that there are pockets on the campus where you can go at various parts of the day and only see white students or only see black students or only see Asian American students, right? There were these durable pockets of racial balkanization on the campuses we study. That part of King's dream remains unrealized. I want to take this back to Chicago for a moment because, again, the speech I'm giving right now happens in a context. What you see here through the decades, from the 70s into the 2000s, are visible pockets of racial clustering and segregation, residentially. So even where people live, right, would suggest to us that the King dream of little black boys and little white boys and others interacting substantively is far from realized. Now, because we're at an institution of higher education and I'm a professor of higher education, I do want to spend the rest of my time talking about higher education. And I want to use a portion of a King quote to sort of move us into this consideration of education in the modern day problems of race in US post-secondary education. So King suggested that the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. He argued that intelligence plus character, that is the true goal of education, right? Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education, King argued. I believe that that is still true. But there are lots of data that suggest to us that access to various forms of education remain unrealized, remain racially segregated, remain racially unavailable to particular students, and also remains unavailable to students from particular class backgrounds, right? We took up part of this in a 2010 article published in the Journal of Higher Education, two colleagues and I. In, in this particular article, we traced legislative attempts to increase access to higher education for black students throughout the lifespan of American higher education, right? So we walked through year by year, decade by decade, attempts that were made in the law to increase the representation and success of black students at colleges and universities. At the end of this work, we thought about titling this piece Two Steps Forward, or Three Steps Forward, Two Steps Back. Because there's been some really aggressive regression, taking back, undoing, unraveling of things for which King and others fought over the years to increase the representation and to honor the humanity of students of color generally and black students in particular in US higher education. In the piece, we said that it was ingrained into the fabric of education that African Americans did not possess the mental capacity to learn, nor had we any real need for formal education. There was sort of a presumption that, well, stupid blacks, we didn't really need education, right? Just put us in the fields and sort of let us sort of work with our hands, right? That, 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 that was one argument, one imagining at a particular moment in US history. Uh, we go on to say the US was founded on racist principles that have permeated systems upon which it continues to function, even today, right? As I hear black students and other students of color on college campuses unpack experiences like the following, it reminds me of how deeply ingrained sort of these ideas of 
black intellectual inferiority are in institutions of higher ed. So here's the story. A couple years ago, I gave a talk at a predominantly white university. I got there one day early, so I had dinner with about 30 black undergraduate men. A portion of my research focuses on black male success in higher education, so the organizers of the event asked me if I would go to dinner with some brothers on the campus, and I said, sure, as long as I don't have to pay, right? <laughs> so we went to dinner, and I threw out a very simple question one that I actually threw out at lunch today. There were two students um, there at lunch, and I threw out the same question. What is it like to be a black male student on this campus? Now, unlike at lunch today, um, there were no administrators or faculty members at the dinner. It was just me and the 30 guys. So two hours later, guys are still responding to that very first question. What is it like to be a black dude on this predominantly white campus? And they're unpacking all sorts of deeply problematic stories about their realities. One student told a story of how he was the only black student in a large lecture style course. Now, he estimated that there were at least 200 students in the course, and it met in a large lecture hall. So he talked about how the professor made a very generous, and I would argue a ridiculously generous deal with students that I would never make, right? But the professor made this deal with the students concerning a sequence of exams. Now, apparently, the exams built on each other in the sequence. They got progressively harder. The deal was, if at any point in the series, a student got 100 on any exam, that student would be exempt from the remaining exams in the sequence. So the student went on to tell how they had taken the first exam, and they got their grades electronically the night before class. The very next day, at the beginning of class, the professor stood at the podium and said, there are seven of you who got 100 on the exam. You may pack your things and leave. So as it turns out, the students had to walk down the stairs in the lecture hall and actually pass by the podium to get out the door where the, where, where the professor was standing. So one after the other, the students packed their things and they made their way down the stairs to, to exit the door. Six of them got out with, with no question. But the seven, the student who was telling me this story at dinner, was stopped by the professor and asked with the tone of surprise, wait, you got 100%? The professor seemed to be surprised that the only non-white person in the class had managed to get 100 on the exam. That, I'm afraid, is traceable back to this presumption of intellectual inferiority of black students, of black people, of black humanity, against which Martin Luther King, W.E.B. Du Bois, and numerous others fought. You see James Meredith here. Meredith was the first black student at the University of Mississippi. It was rough getting James Meredith to the University of Mississippi. There were violent protests by students, by the governor of Mississippi and others, right, that protested James's right to have access to the University of Mississippi. The picture that you see of him here, so eventually they were forced to let him in. But the picture that you see of him here is not an uncommon one. He had to sit in the back of the classroom. So James Meredith didn't voluntarily sit in the back of the classroom. He was made to sit there. Now metaphorically, I still hear a lot of black students, even today, talk about feeling like they're made to sit in the back of the classroom. Now sure, 
professors are not behaving as recklessly as they were at that time and actually saying to black students that you must sit in the back of the classroom. But it is the sort of constant articulation of low expectations and the constant uh, microaggressions, racial microaggressions against black students and black humanity that make students feel like they're being made to sit in the back of the classroom. There is this constant confrontation with a term that I've called onlyness, being the only person of color in practically every space you enter, in practically every class you take, that makes one feel like they're sitting, they're made to be sat in the back of the classroom. Now recently, some students at UCLA called attention to this experiential reality and constant confrontation with loneliness. They made a, uh, a YouTube video. These guys called themselves the Black Bruins, right? And one of many statistical realities that they acknowledge in the video is that black men are only 1.1% of undergraduates at UCLA. Imagine what it must be like to be 1.1% of 30 something thousand students. But yet, they're nearly half of the football and men's basketball teams there. So the thing here is that, you know, a place like UCLA and like many other predominantly white college and university campuses on which I speak, I hear admissions officers and others say, but we just can't find qualified academically prepared students to black students to admit here. That's the problem. The Chicago public schools are just not producing them. We need not send our admissions officers over to the south side of Chicago to recruit because there just isn't black talent there that is academically capable and ready to be admitted to a place as prestigious and as rigorous and as serious as this. But yet, they could be found to be played on revenue generating sports teams. These are the kinds of civil rights, social justice, racial justice, racial realities that these students and others are calling attention to in the modern day. Now, it's worth noting that this particular UCLA video has been viewed as of last uh, night over 1.7 million times on YouTube. I couldn't help but wonder what might have happened if Martin Luther King had a YouTube channel or if he had Twitter or Facebook. All of the technological resources that we now presently have to raise consciousness about the realities of race, about oppression, about social injustices and so on. I would imagine that Martin Luther King and others would have been able to move the country forward in ways that we have not yet been, been able to do uh, in, in recent years. Here's some black students protesting at uh, University of Wisconsin in the early 1970s. There was a racist incident on the campus and the uh, administrators at the time did not offer what these students deemed to be an acceptable response to that incident. Similarly, just uh, three years ago, there was an incident on my campus. I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, paradoxically, I direct the Center for the Study of Race and Equity in Education at Penn. But yet, what you see here is black students standing against racism on the campus. This is just one of hundreds of racial incidents that continue in the modern day on college campuses. On Martin Luther King Day last month, students in a fraternity at Arizona State University dressed in blackface and did all sorts of other things that were racist in celebration of Martin Luther King Day, right? These are racial realities with which we are persistently grappling 
in U.S. higher education. I would imagine that you probably even have your own here at Elmhurst College, right? I can't help but wonder, though, how much dialogue there is about them. What are the preventative measures as opposed to the reactive approaches to dealing with those kinds of racial tensions and racial realities? By reactive, I mean usually it takes some sort of event to get students to protest and then to get the administration to meet some sort of uh, demands. We can talk more about that in just a second. Um, or perhaps it takes something like this. A Cinco de Mayo south of the border party off campus at University of Delaware. Students dressed as landscapers with Pedro and Jose name tags on their work shirts. Written on the back, Spick and Span Gardeners. I was disgusted. I was surprised, shocked. All three of the students photographed are members of a campus honor fraternity. A fact that outraged the university's Latino students after pictures of the party were posted on Facebook.com. To know that my own peers um, have looked down upon the Latino community and see us in this manner and have called us derogatory terms, it was just shocking. Other party goers wore Mexico t-shirts. The back of one said, full of tequila. No matter how far we think that we're going, it seems like people are doing the same things over and over. In recent months, students have been throwing racially themed parties across the nation. At California's Santa Clara University, white students dressed as Latino janitors, gardeners, and pregnant teens at a similar south of the border party last February. At Clemson and University of Connecticut, so-called gangsta parties parodied African Americans. So it's usually situations like this this is an example of racial violence, by the way. Sure, it's not the same kind of 1950s racial violence against which King and others fought, but it is, in fact, an attack on people's humanity and right of belongingness in a place. But it's usually situations like this, it takes something like this to get a real conversation going about our ongoing quest for racial justice, civil rights, the full inclusion of diverse populations on a campus and so on. More recently, students have been protesting at University of Michigan the past couple weeks, in fact, and uh, they created a hashtag on YouTube, uh, BBUM, which is short for being black at University of Michigan. Now, this particular student protest came with a list of demands and they, the students have skillfully used social media to call attention to the experiences of students of color in Ann Arbor on that campus. Uh, here's one tweet. Uh, they said the Black Student Union has given the university a short time period to respond to the demands before more action will be taken. One of the uh, seven demands, uh, the fourth of the seven in fact, is that we demand an opportunity to educate and be educated about America's historical treatment. So in this particular demand, students are asking for greater representation in the curriculum. So as we think about James Meredith entering the University of Mississippi, a place that did not want him there, I can almost guarantee you that James Meredith and his people were not represented in the curriculum that was being taught at Ole Miss at that time. There is a chance that James Meredith and people like him are still not represented in the curriculum at Ole Miss, perhaps except for in black studies. Right? Here's our ongoing quest for racial inclusion in higher education. Students of color, black students especially, are asking to be more justly represented in the things they read, in the things that are taught to them, and so on. Now I must say that I was quite impressed and intrigued by the articulation of who you are and what you value in light of the problems that I've talked about 
America's ongoing problems with race in, in higher education. I was intrigued by your mission statement. Uh, surely everybody here knows what it is. So I will only read to you the first line of it, just as a refresher. You say in your mission statement that Elmhurst College inspires the students to form themselves intellectually and personally and to prepare for meaningful and ethical work in a multicultural global society. That's not a, a paraphrase, by the way. So the kinds of problems that I've talked about do not apply to you, given what you've articulated here, right? So surely there must not be any noticeable patterns of racial balkanization or segregation in any sort of way. Surely students of color must feel themselves honestly and authentically and respectfully represented in the curriculum. Surely racial microaggressions and articulations of low expectations are not something with which students of color here are confronted. Surely your white majority are engaged in consciousness raising educational experiences that do in fact prepare them for participation in a racially diverse democracy that is much more diverse than the county in which the college is currently situated, that is more racially diverse than the college itself, right? I want to go back to the we shall overcome. And I want to play a clip here from the King speech. We shall overcome. Deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome. No, I join hands so often with students and others behind jail bars singing it. We shall overcome. Sometimes we've had tears in our eyes when we joined together to sing it, but we still decided to sing it. We shall overcome. No, before this victory is won, some will have to get thrown in jail some more, but we shall overcome. Don't worry about us. Before the victory is won, some of us will lose jobs, but we shall overcome. Before the victory is won, even some will have to face physical death. But if physical death is the price that some must pay to free their children from a permanent psychological death, then nothing shall be more redemptive. We shall overcome. Before the victory is won, some will be misunderstood and called bad names and dismissed as rabble rousers and agitators. But we shall overcome. And i tell you why. We shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We Relax. No one will need to be thrown in jail. No lives will need to be lost. But in order for us to overcome these historical and contemporary racial problems in US higher education, campuses must disrupt segregation. Campuses must more responsibly represent and diversify its curriculum and the people who are represented in it. Conversations about the realities of race on campus must be commonplace. Colleges and universities must enact their missions and the things that are the values that are articulated in their missions on their websites, in their admissions materials, in presidential speeches, and elsewhere. If we could do those things, I believe that we will overcome some of these very violent, personally tumultuous racial problems in US higher education. That is my dream of what I believe Martin Luther King would have dreamed if he were giving this speech here today. Thank you so much. We have 
we have time for questions. So we have microphones on each side of the room. So if you could just put up your hand if you have a question, we'll come to you. What is your take on um, the effect that the prison industrial complex uh, has on the access for black males especially to attend higher education? Sure, great question. Um, so here's the thing. One of the uh, most aggravating myths about black men in our society is that there are more of us in prison and jail than there, than there is in college. That, that, that's, that's not true. It's, it's, it's not true. It is statistically inaccurate, right? Um, now, that is not my way of minimizing, obviously, um, the realities of mass incarceration and the inequitable rates of, of incarceration among, uh, among men of color. But I just think that it's important to just say out loud that there are more black men in college than in prison. Uh, now, that being said, your question reminds me of the work that we've been doing in New York City with the 40 public high schools I mentioned. Those 40 public high schools are part of the New York City Young Men's Initiative, um, which is an initiative that is funded. Um, the annual investment in that particular initiative is $44 million. Now, $44 million may sound like a lot of money, right, to invest in black and Latino males. It sounds like an impressive figure, 44 million annually. Here's the thing, $44 million is what it takes to incarcerate 715 people annually in New York. 715, right? So what the mayor and others in, in New York City have determined is that this kind of upfront investment in young men's communities, in the schools they attend, providing resources for them and their families that will ensure productive engagement as citizens in New York and uh, in our larger society, will have some longer term effects on the number of them who are incarcerated later in life. Does that make sense? So I, I think a lot about disrupting sort of these, these patterns of, of prisonization. And I think uh, the New York City example is, is, is a really promising one. Hi, Dr. Harper. Do you find the entire concept of Black History Month offensive? No, because I am a take what I can get kind of guy. <laughs> um, I do think it's problematic, uh, for sure, that, you know, it's during February that, you know, there is some concentration on uh, the range of black experiences in our country. However, um, yeah, if it's not going to happen during the other 11 months, um, thank God for, for the one month where, where it does happen more routinely. Now, obviously, my preference would be for it to happen across the 12 months in, in a super responsive way, responsible way. But we've not yet seen very many examples of where that, where that happens as often as it should. Um, I've had several conversations with peers, classmates, coworkers about affirmative action. And several times I've heard white students say that they feel affirmative action is racist towards white students. How would you respond to that statement? I, this is not a cop out, so I'm still formulating my response. <laughs> I want to know how have you responded to that question when, or that, that statement? Personally, I feel that just because myself, for example, gets into a higher education institution, that does not mean I'm afforded the same privileges, opportunities, and expectations as another student. So just simply letting me in isn't the same as me being provided the same internships or classroom experiences as a white student 
so I don't think it's racist in a sense, especially because racism is institutionalized, whereas I think people confuse racism with personal hatred. That was quite thoughtful, yes. <laughs> I will say about affirmative action um, that it most certainly doesn't work very well. If we look at the durability of the trends over time, it's not like the floodgates have been opened here at Elmhurst <laughs> and elsewhere and tons, thousands of blacks and Hispanics are taken over. I don't know that there, I don't know that there are um, I don't know that there is uh, statistical proof of that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm just not, not so sure, right? Um, I am a believer in intentionality, that if an institution is in fact attempting to enact its mission and its values and visions articulated by presidents and others, that, that demands some level of intentionality. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily that um, there's sort of an abandonment of standards or that some people who don't deserve to be there are there. Uh, let me see if I can offer an analogy. I've been a faculty member now for 11 years. And we've done searches for faculty colleagues just about every one of those years at the University of Pennsylvania, where I've been for seven of those. Now, when we do a search, we don't need, there are eight of us on the higher education faculty there. We don't need eight versions of the same person who does the exact same thing. Were we to have that, well then it wouldn't be an intellectually exciting program, and the program for sure would have some content gaps. Now, some would argue that you should just search for the best person you can get, right? This is sort of way of like not being intentional. But we're very intentional that we need a policy person. We need a person who's an expert on student development and student outcomes. We need a historian. We need a person who studies organizational change and academic governance in college, right, to round out our curriculum. Well, that demands a certain level of intentionality in our searches. So in that same way, institutions that are attempting to diversify the student body and to deliver on the promise of diversity that is represented and articulated in a mission statement, well, then you need a diverse student body to deliver on that, for sure. One cannot legitimately claim to prepare students for a global world if you don't have diversity represented in the student body. So there has to be some in intentionality there. <laughs> okay, so I have some friends who Recently, we were asked to do a little bit of speaking uh, at a choir event about slavery and the history of music and slavery. Um, and I, some of my friends expressed that they were really uncomfortable talking about that. Um, and I was wondering how you feel about that and how, what, what do you think about these were white friends, which is maybe important. Um, so I just found that very interesting and I wondered if you had thoughts about that kind of thing. I do have thoughts. <laughs> um, my thoughts are going to sound judgment laden for sure, right? Um, but when I go back to the values and aspirations that are articulated in your mission statement, I got to say that surprises me. <laughs> it would seem to me that people would be fluent in conversations and comfortable in conversations and discourses about America's racial history, for example. I mean, it is about sort of ethical work in a global, multicultural, global society. Well, that society has a past. 
So it seemed to me that students would have sort of amassed a degree of comfort in talking about this from history courses that they've taken in the general education curriculum here. I mean, do you have that? I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe you do, maybe. I, I may be like hitting on some nerves here. I'm just gonna stop soon, but. Um, <laughs> There is something about uh, a discomfort with particular questions and topics that seem not right for a college-educated person to be grappling with, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I guess my, my thoughts are that that surprises me that people were uncomfortable talking about that. They should see together uh, 12 Years a Slave and then have a conversation about it afterwards. That's my recommendation. That would be really good. Then after that, they should also watch Rosewood together. Um, and then Roots, in that order. <laughs> right? In that order. I think that that might, in fact, engender a certain degree of comfort in having something to say about it. Thank you. My, gra my background is more in corporate America. And I had a question. Um, maybe you could tell me how does it work in, in education. Um, I saw two companies that I worked for have to fulfill government contracts. They would not have those government contracts if it continued to be a white snow in those offices. And it was. And those contracts contracts were in serious jeopardy. And so in order to uh, make sure that they could make the money, they told their recruiters, okay, we've got affirmative action here, go get white women. Uh, over the course of, I would say, uh, I'm, I'm speaking from my, my witness, over the course of eight years, we then had a larger percentage of women than we did males, but I was the only black female until I hired another black female um, and a couple of Hispanics. And then when I left, it went back to a snowdrift. These are large corporations. One was third uh, in its size in the US. Um, the other one, number one, in um, privately held industry. In education, when it comes to affirmative action, and, w and when I speak to my white friends concerning affirmative action, it's so embedded that this is for black people and it's something special for them and I don't like it because I don't get that candy. Is it that way in higher education? I'm sorry, it's probably yeah. a wacky and, question. And I want to jump in before she leaves. So the student who asked the affirmative action question, I see her packing up at the bottom. Hey, you. Uh, yes, so I forgot to say this, because your point is spot on. Over time, historically and contemporarily, white women have been the biggest beneficiaries of affirmative action. Now, that is true. Like, and it's not like even like by a little bit. By large margins, white women have been, so the next time that one of your friends is saying, oh, like, it's racist, you should say, well, maybe it is, given that your people have been the biggest beneficiary of it, right? Like, that could be a perfect response to the affirmative action is racist position. I'm, I'm sorry, white women have been the biggest beneficiaries of, I didn't catch the Affirmative point. action. Oh. So yes, it does work that way um, at, at the university. So thank you, thank you for that. That was that was really important. Yeah, I have a question about um, in your studies on uh, college campuses whether you see um, I don't know if I would call it unintentional, but uh, segregated housing. And the and the reason I'm asking that is I graduated from Northwestern, let's say late '60s. Very few black students at Northwestern where I went, but I kind of noticed in the freshman dorm, they were all kind of in the same floor, same area. 
And then my younger son graduated from University of Illinois, large school, his freshman year, very big dorm. And I noticed that he was one of the few white people in his dorm. And it was mostly people of color and so on. And I kind of thought, well, you know, that's kind of cool. But wait a minute, you know, they called the dorm the ghetto. And I mean, this is like a large university. So do you, do you still see patterns of that? I sure do. Um, I have two responses to, to, to that. Um, one is that I absolutely see hundreds of places where racial segregation is the norm. They're called fraternity houses on Fraternity Row. So I'm writing a book that's titled Race Matters in College. And in this particular section of the book, I'm writing about what I call Jim Crow Row, the place on campus where you are almost guaranteed to see nothing but white folks. So yes, indeed, hundreds of them are living in houses all by themselves in a single house, then right next door to it is another hundred, and so on, right? So oftentimes when we talk about these patterns of racial segregation on the campus, it is in fact framed around sort of black theme housing. Um, so there's like a, a, you know, a black floor in a dorm, right? Or a, a floor that is sort of sculpted around black culture and that is colored as problematic. Or that there's a particular residence hall on the campus that tends to attract you know, larger shares of students of color. That is color problematic. But yet we don't color problematic, you know, I've been to University of Illinois. I've been on Greek Row there. And um, well, yeah, racial segregation for sure is pervasive there. Perhaps more so than, you know, the, the one or two floors in the residence hall where, you know, there are a couple dozen black students living. So that's one response. The other is that, um, Beverly Daniel Tatum, a social psychologist, an eminent one. She's also uh, president of Spelman College in Atlanta. She famously wrote a book that was titled, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? I want you to read that book, so I won't spoil the plot for you here. I will tell you, though, that one major takeaway in Tatum's book, in response to that question of why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria, is because if you look around the lunchroom, all the white people are sitting together. But it's the black table that is colored problematic, that look at these black kids, they're segregating themselves. But do we not see the 50 other tables that are all white? Why are we not troubling those? in our questioning and in our conversations about, uh, about, about these, these trends. Dr. Harper, thanks for your provocation today on the hallowed theme, we shall overcome. But I'm interested in your use of the term disruption at several points in your speech. What I wonder is whether or not you can point to any examples where disruption has created the space that becomes the bridging space for getting at your cafeteria example, bringing people together in a way that creates new conversations. And I'm interested in examples that might come from the community level, might come from institutions, might come from organizations as well. Sure, great question, I love it. Um, I'm going to stick with the institution level for now. Um, and I will give you at least two examples um, that have been disruptive. One, in fact, was at the University of Pennsylvania where I showed you that um, a couple years ago we had this racial incident on the campus and so on. Um, one of the things that the students were saying was that in addition to a, a handful of other racial problems, um, they very rarely had classes with professors of color because there are very few of us. In fact, I'm the first and only to have ever been hired in my department at Penn, right? So students you know, talked about not having a lot of faculty of color. My president and provost decided to disrupt that by investing $50 million into faculty diversity. They put $50 million on the table to disrupt 
these long-standing patterns of problems, you know, concerning the diversification of the faculty. That's one example. Another is um, intergroup dialogues on college campuses are in fact disruptive spaces. They're spaces where students um, talk in a very honest and deeply reflective way. Uh, they respect each other. They respected each other's arriving at the conversation, perhaps in different places developmentally. But it is a conversation that breaks down sort of these fears of being, you know, misunderstood or being, you know, miscolored as naive or racist or homophobic or whatever. And students are able to really talk and grow and, and so on. Those have taken place at UCLA, at University of Michigan, and dozens of other campuses across the country. The problem with them, though, is that they tend to be small you know, 20, 30 students. So it's a transformational experience and, in fact, a really disruptive opportunity for those 20 or 30 students, but not so much for, you know, the 33,000 others who don't get a chance to uh, participate in those kinds of things. So I think, I think that is uh, a promising example that, if scaled appropriately, could be really disruptive. Um, I talked about this uh, in my last session with a group of my student affairs colleagues here at, at the college a couple hours ago. Um, I teach two courses. Among the courses I teach at Penn, there are two. Um, one is on race in higher ed, and the other is called gender in college. Um, in those courses, there's an assignment in which I force students to be disruptive, right? So in the gender course, you know, I help them to understand how sexism and misogyny and problematic gender language and gender violence and all of that is all around us. We just have to be aware enough and conscious enough to see it. Then we also have to be courageous enough to address it. But people don't address it because they don't have experience addressing it, right? They're nervous about how people are going to react. So I forced them, as an assignment in the course, to pick four different moments in, in their real lives outside the class where somebody is talking about or behaving in a way that is problematic. And they have to disrupt it. And they have to write about it. They have to write about what they did, how they felt, how the person reacted on the other end of it, um, and what they learned from the experience. Now, inevitably, over the four journal entries, the first one, the students say, I was really nervous. And I was so, I had so much anxiety about bringing this up. But by the fourth one, people are smooth sailing. They, they're very comfortable. It's because I created for them the rehearsal space to be disruptive. That is promising to me. And I, and I, I continue to hear from students who've taken that particular course over the past four years that I've taught it, alums of the program, who say, you have changed my life. Like, I, I continue to do this. Like, four years later, I'm still calling someone out when they do something that is, is really problematic. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we have to teach students to, to do that. We're going to take two more questions. Okay. Hi, I'm Chrissy. I'm a writer with the Leader of our School Paper. Um, but I'm more of a like, personal question anyway. But, um, I just want to say like, that I've noticed, I, like, it was cool that you brought up our mission statement because um, just this last weekend we had a Bill Nye at Science Guy lecture that sold out the chapel, but we have a lecture of Martin Luther King Jr. that fills up, I don't know how many seats are in this room, and so it's disheartening to me to see that there's such lacking zeal about equality and about social justice at a school that claims to be about social justice. And so kind of my question is if you have any advice of how to get, because there's a lot of student organizations I'm sure present in the room, how we can get more students behind the idea of actually making change, and most importantly, how we can get the college to follow through with the mission and to actually get students in the classroom to be engaged and to care about these issues. So it has to start where you just ended, right? The one place that every student at Elmhurst College has to go, if she or he wants to be successful, is class. Right? Faculty members must find opportunities to more responsibly 
um, and with higher degrees of intentionality integrate into their uh, into their courses opportunities for learning about about these kinds of these kinds of issues um, I was totally intrigued um, over lunch to hear that there is a course about gender and crime and to hear that race is talked about in that course and it's okay right I mean it's, it's okay right like people sure there may be some discomfort in the beginning but it's okay right people learn and they're, working on it. they're working on it race and sexuality it works the professor of the course is here right <laughs> so um, yeah there there have to be there, there. There has to be more integration in the curriculum. I know that Russ does this in his courses and in things that that he teaches. I saw his bookshelf. Um, when uh, I leave here, he's whisking me away to talk with a group of students about a book that one of my friends wrote about black men, um, and it's great, right? I mean, th that was pretty easy to do, right? To pick the book and to have students read it. That's what professors do, right? So there, it, 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 has, to, it has to start there. Another thing that um, has to become sort of a, a, a larger part of the functioning of the place is using the mission statement as a reflective mirror. Constantly asking the college to make good on the promises and the aspirations that are articulated in that mission statement. Um, students can and should do this, right? Um, we don't have time for me to tell another story, so I won't. What I will say, though, is that if I were um, a white student, I've never been one, so I'm just sort of imagining what it must be like to be one. Yeah. I wouldn't want my college to send me out into the world engaging in sloppy racial mistake making that's going to get me labeled as racist, where the place where I'm going to work, or racially misunderstood, right? Like, I just wouldn't want to go out and embarrass myself. I also wouldn't want to go into a workplace that is much more diverse than the college I attended and be utterly unprepared for leadership and you know cooperation and collaboration with colleagues in that space. Especially if the college promised me that I'm going to leave here prepared for that. I'd be really upset about about that if I if I were a white student. So I think that uh, diversity and social justice topics cannot just be seen as things that are important for people of color. They're also important for white people who will leave here and enter, again, a, a, a really diverse uh, democracy. All right, last question here. The pressure. I uh, was thinking about disruption a lot, too, in what you were talking about, and I think in part, this is a comment, and then I'm hoping to see what you would want to say about it. The, what I take to be a very insidious national, not even dialogue, rhetoric of post-racial, post-feminist. To me, that has set us back more than two steps <laughs> in our efforts to have dialogue and to build bridges, especially when we're also trying to work with identity politics in our classroom as well and how you move from identity politics to bridge building. So I guess I'm wondering what you've, maybe something that you've tried to do either in a classroom or in your research to look at disruptions around this problem of post-racial, post-feminist rhetoric? Sure. Um, I haven't taken up the post-feminist rhetoric just yet. Yeah. I mean, I am a gender studies scholar. Um, so in my next, perhaps in my next project, I will I, I will do that more more responsibly. I think them so aligned. Right, they are in fact very quite aligned. Um, so I mentioned that I'm writing a book right now. This title, Race Matters in College, and it's about all the ways that race continues to be significant in U.S. higher education. That book, from cover to cover, is a pushback against this erroneous presumption 
that we've suddenly become post-racial. The book is peppered with hundreds of stories and examples from my research, from the Chronicle of Higher Education and Inside Higher Ed that cover daily you know, uh, news sources across uh, US higher ed. Um, it also includes statistics from the US Department of Education that show you know, some very pervasive racial gaps. And so, so I, I raised this question over and over again in, in the book. If we were, in fact, post-racial, we wouldn't see these things happening. There wouldn't have been that party at Arizona State three weeks ago, right? Um, so I think we have to buy my book um, <laughs> when I finish writing it. Yeah, uh, shameless plug. Um, and sort of use that, right? Someone does need to write, and perhaps this will be, this will seriously be my next project. Uh, someone needs to write a, a complimentary book on the pervasiveness and sort of the, um, how gender matters in college, how gender continues to matter in college. Uh, there's a book, Paying for the Party, that was recently published that raises some of that. Um, but I, I, I would love to see someone take it on, you know, in every sort of corner of, of, of the college and write about it. You've been a terrific audience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for coming. Please. Hi, I'm John Quigley, President and CEO of the Elmhurst Chamber of Commerce and Industry. In these challenging economic times, it's imperative that our residents and businesses band together to not only shop Elmhurst, but buy Elmhurst whenever possible. We have great stores in our city center, Spring Road, Butterfield Road, York and Vallette Streets, St. Charles and Route 83, North Avenue and Lake Street, along North York and even Grand Avenue. I ask for your help. Let's keep our tax dollars in Elmhurst.